Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Good to be with all of you. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 2. We began it last week with the wedding feast at Cana, where the Lord delivered a young couple from the shame of, uh, of not having enough wine to complete the marriage feast. And now we move to another scene, another city in Jerusalem where the Lord delivers the temple of a great scandal. We begin in verse 12, and we'll read through the entire chapter to verse 25. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scriptures, the Scripture and the Word which Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man." May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time in, of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Charles Wesley helped produce a popular image of our Lord when he composed the familiar verse, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child. Our Lord is gentle. A bruised reed He will not break, a smoldering wick He will not quench. He was gentle when he took children in his arms and blessed them. But there was a time when he took a whip in his hand and drove a bunch of businessmen and cows out of the temple. There was nothing gentle about it. It was wrath. It's in stark contrast to Cana where he turned water to wine and he rescued a young couple from social humiliation. He showed himself as Savior. Here he showed himself as judge. He calls to mind the words of the Apostle in Romans 11 verse 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. Both are true of the Lord Jesus, God's Son. He is both Savior and Judge. Dr. Johnson said a few years ago in the previous century, so maybe more than a few years uh, ago. One of the great mistakes of the 20th century is to fail to see that he is to be worshipped in both of these aspects, both aspects of Savior and Judge. We're not far removed from that time when he made that statement, but uh, and nothing really has changed in this 21st century. So. In John 2, we behold the severity of God, which is as true and necessary as His kindness and gentleness. It happened when Jesus entered the temple. 
and cleansed it. The other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each have an account of the Lord cleansing the temple. But the event they described occurred at the end of the Lord's ministry and resulted in a conspiracy by the authorities to have him arrested and put to death. The cleansing occurred in this case in John chapter 2 at a different time, at the beginning of his ministry, three years earlier. So how do we explain that? Well, some have interpreted John as taking the story out of its historical context, its historical sequence, moving it from the end of the Lord's ministry to the beginning for theological reasons. Others explain it as the first of two cleansings. In support of that is a significant difference between the two. As you would read the two, you'll see that there are differences in the two accounts. Leon Morris in his excellent commentary, lists a number of those differences. And he makes the astute, and I think the accurate observation that the evil in question was one which was likely to recur. And that's true. The temple had been turned into a marketplace. It was a very profitable enterprise. Money was made, and lots of it. So it's, it's not surprising that three years later, the people were back in business. It is greed. It's the love of money. This passage not only re reveals a lot about our Lord's character, but a lot about human character as well. It happened at the time of the Passover. Jesus and his family and his disciples had moved down to Capernaum, which is located on the Sea of Galilee. Then, after a few days, they went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. Passover is in the spring, either at the end of March or the beginning of April. Uh, some have put this at the year A.D. 28. It celebrates Passover, the deliverance of Israel from slavery after the tenth plague in which the firstborn of the Egyptians was killed. Uh, but those of Israel were spared because they had the blood of the, of the lamb on the, um, the, the doorposts and the lentils of their doors, their homes. It was an especially important feast. The Passover was one of the three that uh, uh, occasions or feasts in which the Israelites, the men of Israel, were required to appear before the Lord, wherever that tabernacle or the temple was. So, <clears throat> in obedience, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Traveling to Jerusalem is usually described in those words, going up, because it was up in the Judean mountains. But, more, I think, to the point, it's described in that elevated sense because of its sacred place. It was God's chosen city where he had put his name and where he had put his temple. It was the place where God and believers met through the blood shed on the altar of sacrifice. In all of the world, there was no place like Jerusalem and the temple. It was God's house, and it was the center of true worship in the world. But when the Lord entered it, he found that it had been turned into something very common, into a bank and a supermarket, and worse, with all of the sights and sounds of a stockyard. There were those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables, the cattle, sheep, and doves were animals of sacrifice for worship at the temple. The money changers were at their tables for the payment of the temple tax, a half of it, which was a half shekel, but it was to be paid in Tyrian coins because Tyrian currency was of purer silver than the other coins. And so people came from all over the Roman Empire and beyond to pay their tax. Right there in the temple. It was an arrangement of convenience for the pilgrims who came from all over the world. It would have 
been impossible, as you can well imagine, to bring a goat or an ox from Rome or from Persia. So for convenience, a market was set up in Jerusalem, which in principle was a good arrangement. Originally, it was across the Kidron Valley on the Mount of Olives. But at some point, it had been moved into the temple and into the outer courtyard, the court of the Gentiles. And it was there because it was a very lucrative business for the men who ran the temple, the family of the high priest. In fact, the rabbis called the temple market the bazaars of the sons of Annas. And that's the bazaar Jesus entered. If you've ever walked the narrow, crowded streets of the old city of Jerusalem, you've probably gotten a sense of what Jesus experienced when he entered the temple. He, he didn't hear the prayers and psalms of worshipers. He heard the sounds of an oriental market, bleeding sheep and noise of commerce. To a righteous man, it was appalling. But he knew what to do. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out, the sheep and cows and the merchants selling them. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. It was done in real anger, controlled and disciplined and righteous anger. F.F. F. Bruce commented on how some preachers are surprised at Jesus' actions and how he would uh, use or did use such force on animals, though so they had nothing moral involved in this, and yet he drove them out. But as Bruce pointed out, most of those preachers probably have had little experience trying to move cattle in the street that it, it takes a degree of force to do that. But this wasn't excessive force. It certainly wasn't cruel. In fact, you'll notice in verse 16 the way he dealt with the, the doves and the merchants who sold them. He, he drove out the, the sheep and oxen. He turned over tables with coins. But he told the dove merchants, take these things away. He didn't overturn or break their cages, which would have resulted in the merchants losing their birds. In fact, none of the merchants lost any of their merchandise. The money changers could collect the coins off the floor of the temple. The others could find their animals wandering around not very far away. His actions were very controlled. They were purposeful. And the point of it all and the purpose of it all, which he accomplished, which was to clean out the temple. At the same time, he fulfilled prophecy in doing it. He fulfilled the prophecy of Malachi 3. The Lord will suddenly come to his temple. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. He came suddenly to his temple. He found it full of materialism and he purified it. Then he said in verse 16, stop making my father's house a place of business. Now to understand the, the shame of this, the scandal of it, it's necessary to understand the structure of the temple and its function. It was composed of a series of courtyards that led to the central sanctuary where the temple proper was. The outer court was called the court of the Gentiles. It was the only place within the temple precinct in which people of other nations, Gentiles, could come. In fact, it was open to all the nations, the only place where they could be and where they could worship. But when it was filled with merchants and animals where where would these people find a place of worship or the, the atmosphere conducive to worship? And what impression would the, the passing and the exchange of money, this um, merchandising of religion, leave on them? 
leave on these Gentiles? Well, the same impression it leaves on people today when they, they watch a religious program that ends with a plea for money or an offer to sell a preacher's latest book. Religion is business. It's about money. Jesus thought the merchandising of religion was a, a disgraceful message. It was a denial of the truth. What was there in all of this that was taking place in the temple that would attract a pagan to the Lord? What was the difference between what they saw in the temple and the world itself? So he drove them out and he commanded them in verse 16, stop making my father's house a place of business. And the Lord is fervent for purity in worship and life. He's not indifferent. It matters to him. It was a bold act on his part. And I say it matters to him, you see that in the actions that he took. But what an amazing thing that he did. This carpenter from Nazareth came in and he shut down this entire business establishment, which was a major business at the time, and brought everything to a stop. And I can imagine that there was a sense about him. They'd never seen him before. That there was this, this sense about him, this air of authority about them. And as they looked at him and they saw his eyes blazing, they responded just as we see. They were scattered. But it was, uh, it was especially bold to do all of this in the name of his father. In doing that, he claimed to have a special relationship to the temple. It was his father's house. That was a special claim of deity on his part. And that, of course, is the subject of the fourth gospel. The deity of Christ. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing on Him, you may have life in His name. And so because He is the eternal Son of God, He retakes His Father's house and He restores it to order. He cleans it up. It was a brave, bold act. And the disciples recognized it as that. John commented in verse 17 that his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And that's taken from Psalm 69, verse 9, where David was crying to God because of opposition against him due to his zeal for the Lord's house. They, those who were opposed to him, were not sympathetic with David and his devotion to the tabernacle. His zeal for God's house stirred up animosity in many people who were God's enemies. The disciples recognized that David wrote about more than himself, that he was writing about his greater descendant, the Lord Jesus, and they recognized this was prophecy. The Lord's zeal for his father's house stirred up the, the, the same animosity in people toward him as it did in the opposition that David experienced. And opposition and hatred toward him would lead to the crucifixion itself. Where there is zeal for the Lord, there will be opposition. Now, zeal is not fanaticism. The Lord was cool and deliberate in this act of cleansing the temple, not frenzied and chaotic. He was devoted to the Lord, but devotion to God results often in hostility from the world. And it wasn't long before the opposition responded. In verse 18, John said, the Jews came out. John used the term Jews a lot. You find this throughout the fourth gospel, and some have taken that as a kind of anti-Semitic reference to them. It's not at all. John was a Jew. He wasn't anti-Semitic in any way, and it wasn't a disparaging term. He's not using it in that sense. But you see it all through this, this gospel. And often it's used specifically of the Jewish authorities. 
And these were probably officials of the temple or members of the Sanhedrin, the high court. And they were wanting to know what was going on. And asked Jesus to produce a sign, a, a miracle to prove that he had authority to do what he had done and take over the temple. Because that's what he'd done. He'd taken possession of the temple. In his commentary on, the, commentary on this passage, Don Carson pointed out that the authorities had the right to do that. They had the right to question someone who had taken such bold action. But their request for a sign was misguided. The cleansing of the temple was itself sign enough and a powerful one. What kind of man can come in and take over that way and do so suddenly? And if they had a sense of it, they would have understood that it was a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. He came suddenly to the temple. But they didn't think in those terms. They didn't think in terms of the Old Testament scripture and they were really too dull spiritually to have recognized the corrupt condition of the temple and its need to be purified. So they demanded a sign from the Lord. And he responded in verse 19 with a promise, a promise of the greatest sign ever given. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. In the next verse, John explains that Jesus was speaking of his body uh, and, and its resurrection, but it appeared to the authorities that he, that he was urging them to pull down Herod's temple, and then he would rebuild it in three days. Now, actually, rebuilding the temple would have been an easier task than raising the dead. But they couldn't even believe that. And if they couldn't believe the easier, they certainly wouldn't believe the more difficult. So they rejected the statement and they ridiculed it. It took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? It was the response of materialistic-minded, spiritually dull men who wouldn't have believed any sign that he would, had given them anyway. And we see that throughout their history. They ask for a sign, but they're not going to believe any sign that he gives. John then explains the meaning of the Lord's statement in verse 21, that he was referring to the crucifixion and his resurrection. He was speaking of the temple of his body, the body which earlier John said of, spoke of when he said, the Word became flesh, an actual body. He was a genuine man. The Son of God dwelt in that body, which fulfilled all that the temple stood for, all that the temple meant. The temple was where God symbolically dwelt among men and where the altar of sacrifice stood, which gave the sinner cleansing and access to God. But that was only a picture, this temple, this great temple, as well as the tabernacle, only a picture of what would come. It would be in the temple of Christ's body that the final sacrifice occurred in the crucifixion which God showed His acceptance of his for, in the forgiveness of sinners three days later when He raised Christ from the dead. It's one thing we must understand about the resurrection. It's God's amen to Christ, it's finished. It's God's approval, His demonstration historically uh, of his approval of the sacrifice that Christ offered. And so all of this is a foreshadowing of that, a prophecy of that. It's all implied in the statement that the Lord made, but the disciples didn't understand any of this at the time. It wasn't until after the resurrection, John said, that they remembered this and that they understood it. And unlike the Jewish authorities, he said, they believed and they came to understand it. They believed it, it, it all fell into place for them. And, and that would happen again at the end of the Lord's ministry when, after he cleansed the temple a second time, they understood all these things as well. They understood it after the resurrection. Well, the second cleansing of the temple, which we read of in the other Gospels, that was, um, that was too much for the authorities 
and they carried out their plot to have him crucified. And true to their unbelieving nature, when the sign that they asked for occurred, the resurrection, they rejected it. They even conspired to cover it up. It tells us a great deal about faith. It tells us a great deal about miracles. Signs, wonders, miracles are uh, objective proof of the truth, but they don't produce faith. And those religious leaders who demanded a sign and, when they, and, and got that sign, in the obvious event that took place, the resurrection, they still didn't believe. That's the human heart. That tells us a great deal about the human condition. Because that, that the human condition is so destroyed by sin and so enslaved to sin that only the grace of God can change it. And of course, through the inner work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people to open eyes and open the heart to receive the truth and to see the truth, to believe it. God must enlighten individuals in order for them to see, in order for them to understand, in order for them to believe. We are saved by God's sovereign grace. Well, I, I think that scene, when we compare the demand that these men make, and then later at the end, when they get the sign that they've asked for in their response, which is to still disbelieve it. But we see it further in the final verses of the chapter. Jesus remained in Jerusalem, and he did miracles. And John wrote, that because of what the people saw, many believed in his name. Unfortunately, it wasn't genuine faith. And Jesus knew that. John wrote, Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and he himself knew what was in man. He knew that, that these people were attracted to the signs and wonders, not to the one who did them. And that they would fall away as he began to teach and he'd carry on his ministry and they would learn that he was not the kind of Messiah that they wanted. He knew their hearts. He knows the inner reality of everyone. He knows their nature. He knows their spiritual condition. He knows all of us. He knows our secrets. He knows everything. And he knew how deceitful the human heart is because he knew the Word of God. Jeremiah said it best, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who? No one but the Lord whose heart is pure and who is God and who knows all. So for a second time, the Lord renders judgment. He is the perfect judge. He knows all things. He knew the meaning of the market in the temple, which was secularism. And he knew the reality of people's hearts, which was unbelief. It is all more evidence of the great subject of this gospel, and really of all four gospels, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And this passage shows that the Savior is also the judge. His judgment is serious. Behold then, Paul said, the severity of God. His judgment is severe. But it is fair because it is righteous. And He knows all things perfectly and completely. And as judge, he corrected conditions in the temple. He cared about the integrity. He cared about the purity of the, the temple. And he cared about the ministry and the testimony of the temple. And so he cleansed it. And all that has direct application to us today. To the church and to the Christian individually, because while Herod's temple is gone, the Romans pulled it down stone by stone in A.D. 70, we are now the temple. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 
If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. And that is what you are. Paul here in that text in 1 Corinthians 3 is speaking of the local church. Not the, uh, the building in which the saints meet, but the, the saints themselves. The people of God. We, we are the church and the temple of God because the Spirit of God dwells within us. The third person of the Trinity, Trinity literally dwells within you. And so Paul said, we are holy. Therefore, our conduct is to be holy. Be what you are. You are a saint, and a saint means a separated one, a holy one. So that's to be seen in our conduct, and it's to be a reality in our minds. We are to conduct the church, and we are to construct the church Build it according to God's plan, not our own. We're to follow God's pattern as laid out in Scripture. We're, we are to preach the Word of God because as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. We are to observe the Lord's Supper because the Lord has asked us to remember Him often. That honors Him and it blesses us. It's pure worship. We're to sing praises to Him. Music is an important part of worshiping the Lord. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. The Lord's temple, His church, the local church, Believer's Chapel, is important to Him. It is holy. And He deals severely with those who defile it, those who disrupt it, those who would, as Paul put it, would destroy it. But not only is the church the Lord's temple, so are we as individual believers who are the, the spiritual stones of the spiritual temple. A few chapters later in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. You don't own yourself. You don't own your body. He does. He owns it because He's your Creator, and that applies to everyone. But this is special, a special relationship. He redeemed you as a believer in Jesus Christ. He bought you through the precious blood of His cross. That's what He did on the cross. Christians individually are a temple. Our body is. As, as Christ told the Jewish authorities, His body was the temple. Now, different, I think, to a, to, in a greater degree. But we too, our body is God's temple. And so we're to be holy. We're to glorify God in it, in, in our daily life and in our church life. When we gather as a church... We are the temple of God, and, and we are to be holy. Herod's temple wasn't. The priest turned it into a place of buying and selling, a, a market for making money. Well, what do we bring into the church on a Sunday morning? What's in our minds? How do we, how do we approach this very important moment during the week? Do, do we come with a pure heart? Do we come to, to learn of the Lord and to worship Him with thanksgiving, or do we come because, well, it's the habit of life. We've done it all our life, or we know it's the right thing to do, so we do it. I think it's, sometimes that's, that's excuse enough or reason enough. That's reason to come because you know it's the right thing to do, but certainly there are higher motives than that. So how do we come into this place? The Lord cares about that. He, he cares about His temple, meaning us, and what is in us. And He deals with us. We see that very colorfully in the book of Revelation in chapters 1 through 3, where John had a vision of Christ. That's in chapter 1. And one of the most notable features of that vision, as you go back and read it, is his eyes. John wrote that his eyes were like a flame of fire. 
Now that's symbolism, but what do you think it represents? It represents judgment. Fire is pure and his judgment is pure. And I think they must have seen those merchants in the temple, the fire in his eyes. And he sees clearly. His vision penetrates the soul. He knows what is in us and judges. We see that in the next two chapters of the book of Revelation where he speaks to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. Some are doing well, others, most, aren't. They're not pure. One works for Christ vigilantly but lacks love for Him. Another tolerates false teaching. Another one tolerates immorality. Another is rich and materialistic. And so throughout the two chapters, the Lord tells them to repent. Or He said, I am coming to you quickly, or I will come like a thief. Just like He came to the temple there in Jerusalem. And He will come and He will judge and He will purify. He cares that we be holy. As individuals and as a church, we're His temple. And we're to worship Him with purity. And we're to be a witness to the world around us. The world is watching. Just like the world was watching those that were there in that great court of the Gentiles, and they weren't seeing what the Lord wanted them to see. And the world is watching us. Last January, I read uh, an opinion piece in the newspaper by football Hall of Famer Tony Dungy and former tight end Benjamin Watson giving Christian counsel after a year of pandemic and lockdown. The, the article is titled, a call, for Christian, a call for Christian Revival in 2021. Well, it was almost a, a little over a year ago, and it's just as applicable to 2022. And in the article, it is recognized the, the hardships people have experienced and the, the toll that it has taken on many lives with the, all the, uh, the lockdown and all that we've experienced with sickness and that, and, and that, there, that has presented to the church a great opportunity for ministry. But toward the end uh, of the article, they ask the question, if we live like the world, why should non-believers listen to us? More importantly, why would they listen to God? There was the, 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 that was the scandal of the temple. And it's repeated today in the church, the Lord's temple. So much like the Lord in Revelation 2 and, and 3, they, uh, they, they offered counsel for correction. The first suggestion was read the entire Bible. Well, that's the place to begin, of course. The Word of God. The inerrant revelation of the Lord God, which in reading, as the Lord will say later in chapter 17, sanctifies us, changes us. So that's where we begin. But they were suggesting we read the Bible daily. We do it, read it all in a year. It takes some discipline, but it's not all that difficult. It's not too late to start. The middle of January now. And second, they said pray. And then third, repent. That's what the Lord told the churches to do. And we need to do that. Behold the kindness and severity of God. There is severity. We need to know that. But also among the Lord's warnings to the churches, we see His kindness. He stood at the door of the materialistic church of Laodicea, knocking desiring to be invited in to dine with them, to fellowship with them. That's what He wants with us. That's what He wants with you. To come in and dine and fellowship so that you might know Him better and you might be blessed because that's the consequence of knowing the Lord. It is spiritual blessing and life. Jesus is the judge, but He's also the Savior. While he did not entrust himself to all men, we see at the end of chapter 2, because he knew them, 
He does promise to entrust Himself to all who truly trust in Him. He saves all who do. He rescues them from His judgment. He rescues them from the wrath to come. He gives forgiveness. He gives eternal life. So if you've not come to Him, if you've not believed in Him, I exhort you, come, trust in Him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He receives all who do. And then may, by, by, by God's grace, may we live for Him daily. Live a life that is of service to Him and to others. Well, let's end by standing and singing number 50 in the Songs of Praise book. Here is love and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 50. Father, we thank You for those wounded hands. And then we thank You that they are always stretched out to a rebellious world, inviting the sinner to come to Him. He is the Savior. He's the judge, but fortunately He is the Savior. And by Your grace, You've saved us. you brought us to a saving understanding of Him and trust in Him. And I pray, Lord, that You would give us a great desire to know Him better and to pursue the life that He has set forth for us. And we'd be a great witness to those around us. So we look to You to bless, Lord. We thank You for this time together. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.